Welcome back to part two of our double podcast episode about the Grunwick strike. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and listen to that first. À la mattina, appena alzata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 à la mattina. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that our podcast is only made possible because of support from you, our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access to podcast episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merch and other content. Join us and find out more at patreon.com slash working class history. Link in the show notes. Now, one organisation which did a lot to support the Grunwick Strikers was the local Trades Council in Brent, the London borough in which the dispute was taking place. Trades councils are basically organising bodies in which mostly lay representatives, i.e. not paid union officials, from all different unions in a given area, meet together and coordinate. Many of these today are quite moribund, but at the time many of them were highly active, as Sujata, a member of the Grunwick 40 group, explains. I think as well that perhaps if it had, if it had maybe been a different trades council mm. um, who hadn't mm. been so receptive, mm. um, the whole thing may have taken a completely different trajectory. Mm. You know, the fact that Brent was relatively open-minded and progressive mm. at that time and open to these ideas mm. absolutely had, had an impact. Yeah. So it made a huge difference. Yeah. This is Amrit Wilson, author and activist who was deeply involved in supporting the Grunwick strikers at the time. A key issue in the difference in response to the Grunwick strikers compared with previous strikes of Asian, black and migrant workers was that the struggle was over union recognition itself and the right of workers to join and form unions. One of the important differences at period of typewriters was that workforce was unionised, right? right? Mm. Whereas Grumwick, they well, were fighting yeah. for union recognition. Uh, okay. mm. Within mm. imperial mm. typewriters, mm. the workforce was unionised and the trade unions were supporting a wage differential mm. between the white workers uh, yeah. and the Asian workers. So it was very much seen as um, kind of we're protecting, we represent oh, the white right. workers mm. and we are representing our interests. Mm. Mm. They didn't regard the Asian workers as being part Mm. of the trade union or as even figuring, you know, as deserving representation. The strike became a strike for union recognition rather than a strike because there was racism in the factory Mm. or a strike because there was sexism Mm. or or actually even, you know, people talk about dignity at work and Mm. that kind of also got subsumed as well into this thing about this is a strike for for union recognition. Um, So in that way, it became very easy for the trade unions to to support it in a way that, you know, like you say, it was Mm. an existential question of their their existence and their right to exist. So that was why you were able to have Arthur Scargill come down on the the picket Mm -hmm. line and say, this is a fight for the entire working class Mm. without mentioning issues of racism and sexism but in the process I think a lot of people's eyes got opened Mm. to those issues. The excellent journal Race and Class argued convincingly that the reason trade unions swung so much support behind the Grunwick strikers relative to other strikes by Asian and black workers was that they were defending their part in the social contract with the government which Hamrit discussed in part one. In particular, unions wanted to defend the Employment Protection Act of 1975, which covered rights to join unions, and which was one of the main things that union leaderships believed that they had achieved in return for their pledge to try to keep peace and prevent strikes under the social contract. With the solidarity action by postal workers called off, to put pressure on the employer, Grunwick strikers would have to shut down the plant and stop scab replacement workers getting in. As we discussed in part one, Intervention of the right-wing pro-employer pressure group, the National Association for Freedom, NAF, had made the dispute a big national political issue, and large numbers of workers came to support the Grunwick strikers on mass picket lines. There, strikers and supporters came up against the violent force of the employers, the police. The police uh, violence was very Mm. extreme. Mm. Um, For a start, you know, the, um, the first day of the mass picket, which was actually uh, called a Women's Day. 
I mean, that day there were so many police and they, they used a lot of techniques which later have become, you know, well known, like what we call kettling now. Mm-hmm. And they started that there. Um, and then the SPG were called in. The SPG is a special patrol group uh-huh. who um, they uh, had been like at first tried out in the North of Ireland, mm-hmm. this anti colonial stuff. Right? And um, then they were brought into Britain. And in fact, um, shortly after Grunwick, they led, uh, they were used in Southall during um, an anti fascist demonstration. Mm-hmm. So they were really vicious. And they would go go in, they, they would try two techniques, which I saw myself. One was to go into the crowd and pull people out, sometimes grabbing women by their breasts or, you know, just awful stuff. And people were very badly injured. I mean, obviously, the, the order to send in the SPG had come from, from the state, from, from the government. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I believe, the first time they'd been sent in to an industrial dispute. Right. And... Um, the Gromwick strike had the highest number of arrests, um, a higher number of arrests than any other dispute had had um, in Britain since general strike. By the time the dispute ended, there had been over 500 people arrested. The stories that, that you hear about the level of violence oh, was really, 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 was really horrific. horrific. I mean, and it was are... a very, very scary. It was very scary just to be there, you know. Mm. Because firstly, you were pushed mm. um, right up against, you know, like they were squeezed back. Mm. Mm. And then you were encircled. Mm. So it was a very frightening uh, mm. situation to and be in. The thing to, to remember as well is that if you don't know the area, the, where the Grumwick factory was is not some big mm. industrial mm. It's a very narrow yeah. road. It's a, it's yeah. a residential road. Yeah. It's a, it's a little back street that has nothing else on it except for houses and, mm. and you know, the back end of the tube station. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it's a very, very narrow um, street um, that's full of cars and, and, and houses and garden walls mm. that got knocked over and, and, you know, the levels of crush, um, mm. I think. And then they had their very, bus, very they brought this bus in. Jaya Ben Desai, one of the strikers, who was also the treasurer of the strike committee during the dispute, also had run-ins with the police. This audio is from an interview undertaken by Chris Thomas in 2007. One of the terms Jabin uses, blackleg, is another term for scab. Let me tell you, some of them, they are racialist, but some they were very sympathetic, let me tell you. On picket line, we have all type of uh, experience. Because one of once uh, we have some ladies police, and we some people who were went in who was going inside they were abusing to us and we we told them black leg and something like that and she said don't do that it will damage you because i have to uh, have to uh, arrest you in same way we were sometimes some sympathetic police were there sometimes some racial is there somebody kick on my foot once in a mass picket I think police is for, for, for uh, protecting everybody, not only uh, management. But in, instead of that, police was doing totally different thing. He was, everything was uh, 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 doing according the management, not the strikers. The supporters also, he was abused by the police. They were arrested by, arrested by police. They were hit by police. Everything was done by the police. People who don't know about the history of the police often think that their role is to uphold laws in a given country. The true story, of course, is very different. In disputes like Grunwick, their fundamental role becomes much more clear. So police, when they are used to intervene in significant industrial disputes, typically they don't stand around and ensure that laws aren't broken. In fact, in many cases, they break laws and help employers break laws by violently attacking and arresting peaceful pickets to enable employers to often unlawfully bring in scab replacement workers. And what's interesting is, you know, the the relationship between the factory bosses and Mm. the police was obviously, you know, they were obviously working very, very hand in glove. Mm. Um, In fact, um, there was a senior police officer in charge of policing the strike Mm 
who later became Grunwick's personnel manager, actually during the strike that, that happened, left the police force and became their personnel manager. Um, so, the, you know, the, there was absolutely no question about which side, um, you know, the, the, the police were on. And what, 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 was, what was interesting about that whole process was if you talk to some of the strikers, a lot of them will say, well, you know, I started this strike, I didn't, didn't really have any opinion about, about the police. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about it, never really considered what side they would be on. But, you know, within kind of six months of seeing how they operated, they were just in absolutely no doubt at all about where, where the police, stood. about mm -hmm. where they stood in, in, yeah. in relation to the police, which side that they were on, mm -hmm. and about how the police were completely there just to enforce the will of the employer, which was, you know, corresponding with the, with the British state. When you talk of the state, you know, you have the police therefore, I mean, who are completely in the, you know, in the pocket of the employers. Um, but, and you have the Home Secretary giving orders and so on. But then you have the courts, you know, who, mm -hmm. who rule, uh, give horrible sentences, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the media, which was perhaps the, the, the most powerful thing, mm. uh, reporting entirely on the violence of the, of the people. Mm. And nothing said about the violence of the police at all. In part one, Amrit mentioned that the Labour government and the employer made frequent use of the Special Patrol Group, SPG, forerunners of today's territorial support group, TSG. The SPG were notoriously violent and had neo-Nazis and fascists within their ranks. Not long before the Grunwick strike, SPG officers killed Kevin Gately, a 20-year-old student, during a protest against the fascist National Front. And a little after the end of the strike, in 1979, SPG officers killed Blair Peach, a socialist teacher, who was at an anti-Nazi protest in Southall. While no one was charged in connection with his death, decades later, the police admitted that their officers killed him, most likely with an illegal weapon. When the SPG officers was raided, they had a stash of illegal weapons, including weighted truncheons, knives, crowbars and whips, and at least one officer was found with a personal collection of Nazi memorabilia. Going back to the strike, another group of workers who showed particular solidarity with Grunwick strikers were printers. There was immense solidarity from some of the printing unions, mm -hmm. uh, SOGAT, and as well as turning up on... Uh, the picket lines, um, at one point, some of the unions refused to actually print some of the material that was going into some of the papers. And so there is, it's, it's my favourite clipping in the whole of the Gromwick archive. There is a page in the sun um, from, would have been, I think it was late 1976 or poss possibly 1977, where it appears with half a blank page because the, tr the printing unions actually said, this is bias, this is not a fair representation of what's happening in Grunwick and we are refusing to print this, this column. Mm -hmm. So it was, just, it was just distributed with a, with, a, with a blank section. So, I mean, those kind of things were, were you know, significant. And I think it was difficult to counter the, the media mm. stuff because... Like you say, the, the, the press and the, and the media were, were most interested in the violence. This kind of working class censorship, you could call it, is something which occurred in the UK quite a few different times in different disputes. Probably most famously during the miners' strike of 1984-5, when print workers refused to publish a story in the Sun tabloid, painting union leader Arthur Scargill as Hitler. This was probably a big reason Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government and Rupert Murdoch, who owns The Sun, were so keen to break the organisation of print workers, which they did in the whopping dispute of 1986-7. There was one minor incident which the media covered in great detail. Here we're just going to include the whole clip from our interview, including my co-host Matt. And so there was this one occasion where a police officer on the picket line was hit by a bottle, uh, I think it was a flying milk bottle, um, and ended up in hospital. Which, so uh, back in those days, would have been glass. <laughs> would have been uh, glass, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I've only got a vague memory of glass milk bottles. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. the thing with it being a residential street. Somebody mm, yeah. just it would have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you used to have doorstep yeah. deliveries in those days. Yeah, yeah. So they had milk, milk bottles. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if it was empty or full. No. Um, I guess you left out your empty. That's yeah, right. You yeah, left yeah, out so your empty. Yeah. Um, and this police officer was hit by a by a bottle. Ended up lying on the floor mm. for several minutes, so that there was plenty of opportunity mm. for, mm. for, for photographs. In fact, he's mm. been there for an unusually long time. <laughs> 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 it's like these footballers who take a dive. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but then that, that those, those pictures of that police officer lying on the floor with his with his head cut open became for the mainstream press almost the defining image of mm. that of yeah. the strike. It was everywhere that where you know where you think about an image of Bromwick, it was always that one. And so it was the the, the violence against the police became the kind of over overarching kind of narrative. So then it was. It was very difficult to, to counter that. The strike began to drag on for a long time, and support from union leaderships for the workers started to wane. From trying to win in the streets and workplaces, the union leaderships had switched their attention to courts and conference rooms. The strike went on for close to two years. I think when they got to uh, a year and a half, I think uh, the, the winter of 77, um, They'd become embroiled in these very protracted kind of legal mm. arguments um, and ACAS disputes. ACAS, you may remember, is the Government Conciliation Service. And if you're not aware of it, basically it's not a place where workers win disputes with employers. To prepare its report, ACAS had requested contact details for its employees from Grumwick so it could canvass their opinions. But Gromwick management refused to pass on any information. So ACAS could only produce a report based on the workers it could contact. This report recommended that Gromwick should recognise Apex. Gromwick, supported by NAF, then took legal action to quash the report, arguing that because they hadn't consulted all the workers, it was invalid. After months of court battles, the Court of Appeal overturned the ACAS report, effectively gutting the Employment Protection Act because that meant that employers could block unionisation just by refusing to cooperate with ACAS. The trade unions had really got distracted by, by these processes mm. and put their faith in them and called off the kind of mass action and the, and the picketing. And they really lost momentum by, by deciding to wait out that, that process. Um, and it's... It's very sad that it, it kind of just fizzled out over, over the course of 1977. Very worried and embarrassed by the militancy of some of the action and, and the numbers. Mm. And they were quite clearly having a lot of pressure put, put upon them mm. by the government. Mm. So you could see at the very top level how much concern there was mm. about what was happening at Grunwick. And you could see that there was pressure being brought to bear on the strike committee and the strikers um, by, by the Apex Union. So it very much felt like there was nowhere left to go. In June 1977, the strikers rebelled against the legalistic tactics being forced on them by Apex and the TUC. So they issued a new call to restart mass picketing. When rank-and-file workers started to respond to the call, this pressured Apex to support the call themselves in order to avoid losing all credibility with the strikers. The first new mass picket took place on the 13th of June, and again pickets were violently attacked by police. 84 workers were arrested, and again the press focused on supposed injuries suffered by police officers. This new wave of mass pickets wasn't as big as they had been. But on the 15th of June, something happened which could have changed everything. Rank and file postal workers defied their union executive and again began a renewed boycott of Grunwick's mail. This was especially important given the time of year, which was just before the holiday rush, when people would be sending in their rolls of film taken during their annual summer holidays. The boycott was hugely successful, but in early July, post office management fought back. Unfortunately, for our action in support of the uh, Grunwick strikers, we were locked out. Contrary to common belief that we went on strike, we did not go on strike. We were willing to deliver the mail 
to people in the Cricklewood area at no cost at all to the post office. We were willing to deliver it free rather than be locked down. So the Cricklewood posties wanted to keep delivering the mail to everyone in the area, except Grumwick, and were even willing to give up their pay to do so. But post office management locked out the workers, so nobody got any mail at all. This led to a widespread impression that postal workers had gone on strike in support of the Grumwick workers, which wasn't the case. Despite being locked out, the postal workers held firm for eight weeks and had Grumwick management on the verge of bankruptcy. But then the post office threatened to sack all of the workers, and the UPW told them to go back to work and threatened them with disciplinary action and the withdrawal of strike pay. The national UPW also disciplined and fined several London officials over the boycott. The Cricklewood postal workers gathered at a mass meeting, and by the razor-thin margin of 51 votes to 48, the postal workers voted to return to work. People were crying that they actually had to go back, but people were under pressure because they had mortgages, they had rent to pay, uh, some didn't have families that could support them, some were very near pension age, and they were under great pressure. So being democratic that we were, and being a good union, a loyal union, a, a strong uh, family, that's what we were, we went back. The strikers and other rank-and-file workers made other proposals for solidarity which could have brought Grumwick back to the table, but in the end these didn't result in practical action. The Bank Workers Union declined to cut off Grumwick's access to funding, and the Electrical Workers Union declined to cut off their power, both unions saying that their members were contractually obliged to provide services to everyone. The government commissioned an inquiry into the strike, and Apex then called off pickets once more to wait for the result of the inquiry. But the inquiry was toothless, as while Apex had agreed to abide by the outcome of the report, Grumwick management didn't. This effectively put the nail in the coffin for the workers' last chance for victory. In the end, the government report did recommend the reinstatement of the sacked strikers and suggested that union recognition could be beneficial. But Grumwick management just ignored the report, and so strikers had no choice but to try and keep up the pressure despite their union trying to demobilise them. By November 1977, the relationship between the strikers and union leaders had got even worse. By this point, the Trades Union Congress, TUC, and their union Apex thought that the strike couldn't be won. But the workers disagreed. Four Grumwick strikers began a hunger strike outside the headquarters of the TUC, demanding help in winning the strike. Apex retaliated by suspending them from the union and taking away their strike pay. Jayaben illustrated how the attitude of one senior union official they worked with had changed over time. Oh, first when he came, then he told us very nice words that we are supporting you, we are behind you, and we are get together, we are be, uh, next to you, and you have not to worry about all these things. He get good words, but didn't do anything. And when we take hunger strike, he called inside us, and he threatened us that, look, what you have done, you know that you have, you are fighting to our own people. I said, yes, up to now we were fighting with the management, now we are fighting with our people, because you were hang us on the wire, now he's paining here, we want to die or we want to get down. Now tell us what you are going to do. And he want to know what you, who told us to do the hunger strike. Increasingly isolated, the workers fought on, eventually alone. But by July 1978, Almost two years after the strike began, they decided to call it off. Now, in terms of achieving its stated aims of union recognition and reinstatement of the sacked workers, the strike failed. However, it was successful in forcing Grumwick to significantly increase pay for the workers who didn't strike during the dispute, as well as bring in other benefits like pensions and even transport to work when the factory moved. But the most important legacy of the strike is how it transformed the UK workers' movement. It marked a turning point from the mostly white, organised workers' movement, mostly seeing Asian, black and migrant workers as competitors for jobs, they now mostly began to see them as fellow workers to unite with and fight collectively against the employers. This then helped combat the creation of an almost permanent underclass of workers to be underpaid and mistreated. Many union members realised that rather than be impossible to organise, many migrant workers were actually more militant than those born here. For the first time, in many of the people and my members who worked in the post office had never seen an ethnic group, particularly Indian women, out on a picket line. 
and they thought that this was a great acceptance by them of living in England and taking up the English ways, but not only that, asking to be part of the established community by being members of trade unions, which they were denied. I think that was one of the biggest uh, inspiring acts that made our members support that action. This was partly based on misconceptions that white workers had about migrant workers, many of whom would have been involved in unions and strikes back home. But many white workers didn't realise this. The dispute also helped lots of people understand that fighting against racism wasn't a distraction from fighting for better pay and conditions. It was a central part of it. Since institutional racism enables the creation of a super exploitable layer of workers who can then be used to undercut existing pay and conditions. But now, a little over 40 years later, this lesson is in danger of being forgotten. I think now we're in this situation where, kind of post-Brexit, it's, it's once again, it's become okay to talk about migrant workers bring down wages. Mm-hmm. You know, British jobs for British, British workers. Mm-hmm. Even within the trade union movement, it's become completely acceptable mm. to kind of promote those kind of ideas again. You just had to look at Len McCoskey during his um, yeah. Yeah. Unite uh, re-election campaign, mm. um, talking about uh, free movement and we need stable communities. Yeah. Um, so that whole kind of language has mm. reasserted itself. But at that time of Gromwick, it was the reason it was so important is because for the first time, white British workers started seeing foreign-born workers as part of their working class. Mm -hmm. And that, for that moment in time, it was a change and a very, very powerful moment within the the history of trade unionism in this country. So in recent years, for example, in the Labour Party, first you had Ed Miliband pledging to control immigration on a giant stone plinth. And more recently, on the left of the party, you had Jeremy Corbyn blaming, quote, the wholesale importation of underpaid workers from Central Europe in order to destroy conditions, particularly in the construction industry, end quote. Now, it's not incorrect to say that some employers try to lower their wage bills by hiring migrant workers, but blaming migration for destroying conditions is just completely incorrect. Especially in the construction industry, the deterioration in conditions is more down to decades of blacklisting, union busting, subcontracting and attacks on workers' rights and organisation, which we covered in our recent episodes on the 1972 builders' strike. And painting what is primarily the free and voluntary movement of working class people across borders as wholesale importation is just inaccurate. And speaking of the Labour Party, many of the tactics which were used by their government first against the Grunwick strikers and their supporters were applied later by Margaret Thatcher's Conservatives. It was a preparation for Thatcherism and in fact, um, Jab and they say actually said that, you know, mm. that it's happening to us, but tomorrow it's going to happen to everybody, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but although the, it was sort of a lead up to Thatcherism, mm. um, it was also quite unique, mm. you know, because there hadn't been anything before that or after, to be honest, where you had such a huge number of people mm. fighting the state, you mm-hmm. know. I think that was very, very special for Grumwick. For I mean, it, it was just so amazing. You know, mm. when you think of, there were, at the height of the pickets, there were 20,000 people there, you know. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, this was against the employers in a way against the state. Mm. So it was really, you know, even, even looking back now, it was potentially a kind of a revolutionary moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it was something which, somehow was let go of mm-hmm. um, because, um, well, partly for all the reasons Sujata had mentioned about mm. the, um, the, the unions being afraid and so on, but also because we have to face it because the left didn't have any strategies. Mm. You know, every, it just literally fizzled out and, mm-hmm. and the left were there in force. I mean, every single left party was there. While the Grunwick strike is now celebrated, particularly over the period of its 40th anniversary in the last few years, there's not been much in the way of looking at what went wrong in the dispute. I think it's interesting that um, if you look at all the commemorations of Grunwick, um, 
we've had whenever, apart from um, some which come with 40 organized, um, the ones which have been done by the trade unions, mm. in general, they have not looked at why Grandmith was defeated. Mm. It was this great moment, everybody came together, but then what? Obviously, the 40th anniversary, as it was uh, last year, is, is, is a big thing and because it's it's maybe one of the last anniversaries that we're going to have with, you know, many of the, the original mm. protagonists mm. around and some, some are already um, not with us anymore. Mm. Um, but so, so there have been a lot of events. There have been a lot of events put on by various trade unions in so many of these, of these meetings. Like Amrit said, people are not being honest about mm. the legacy and where it went wrong. There's, it's, this, it's a celebration of unity and solidarity and of Jair mm. Ben Desai. But honestly, I, I went to one meeting in the House of Commons um, that Jack Dromey organised, and to listen to all the speakers on the on the platform, which included Francis O'Grady, Clive Lewis, mm. you wouldn't have thought this strike had been lost, or defeated. You you mm. wouldn't have worked it out. Yeah. Mm. Um, so there's there's this. While yes, there's lots of lots to celebrate. There's also this complete denial mm. about where it went wrong and why it went wrong. And I think that's that's one of the things that it has been very important for us as Grumwick mm-hmm. Forty, is to be to be honest about this mm-hmm. legacy. Mm-hmm. And I think if you, it is a depressing story, mm-hmm. because essentially what happened at Grumwick is some of the biggest mobilisations in the history of the trade union movement mm-hmm. turned into one of the biggest betrayals. Mm-hmm of workers by the trade union movement. Mm. So it's a depressing story, but at the same time, there are uplifting aspects. Jack Dromey mentioned here was a trade unionist on Brent Trades Council during the strike, who later became a very senior union and Labour Party official and MP. Francis O'Grady is the head of the TUC and Clive Lewis is a Labour MP. While there is certainly a lot to celebrate about Grunwick, primarily in terms of the inspirational example set by the workers themselves and in how so many rank-and-file workers came together to support them, from the mass pickets to the postal workers. But it's also true that at the height of its power, the British trade union movement couldn't be one small employer in northwest London. An employer, it's worth pointing out again, who admitted that he was literally days from defeat during the postal boycott. But time and again, union leaderships called off meaningful action in return for meaningless promises. There was another element of much of the commemorations and media coverage of the dispute recently, which was concerning to Amrit and Sujata. There's been a kind of um, very, um, I suppose, orientalist approach towards looking at um, Asian women in struggle mm. and particularly Jaya they say, mm. um, building her up as a star which... Um, was done in a particular way, which is only, um, which only relates to the way um, white uh, sort of the white gaze looks at Asian women. Mm. You know, um, like most recently, we went to a meeting where um, another speaker described Jab and Desai as a woman with sparkling words and sparkling eyes. I mean, you know, you just think, would you say that to a white male? On this, I've certainly never heard of union leaders like Bob Crow or Arthur Scargill spoken about like that. But at the yeah. same time, you'd say that she's this great star, this wonderful woman, and this little woman who was mm. so great. But then uh, there's a scene in the, um, the film which they've been showing um, consistently at every commemoration, which is a real classic. I don't know if you remember that, Sujata, that where she um, where she's making a speech and there's a very large white male hand on her shoulder. Yeah, I've I, seen that. I just thought, you know, the yeah. person who didn't edit that out, <laughs> I mean, 
What yeah. are they thinking? No, I did mm-hmm. wonder whose hand. I did. I did yeah. see that, and I wonder why. But why what, what does this mean? Like, mm-hmm. How do you deconstruct that? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. I mean, it is. It is. I mean, it's a really important point, and um, it's like going of, of all the coverage that there's been over the last eighteen months, and there's been a huge amount of it. Um, I think almost every mainstream media piece on it has used this phrase strikers and sirens yeah. mm. um, which just drives me mad it just the the the, the whole uh, like i says it's so orientalist mm. and it's so like yes let's mark out these people because of their ethnic clothing mm-hmm. it's 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 absolutely infuriating and we made a very deliberate effort um a deliberate decision um, during the commemorations that we were not, we as a group, were not going to use that phrase Mm -hmm. anywhere. And I think there's a way that you can, you can talk about how empowering and inspirational Mm. this strike was because there were Asian women Mm. um, without becoming, without without objectifying these, Mm -hmm. these figures for their, for their difference. And, I mean, people always ask me, oh, kind of, why, why are you involved in this? You, you, you weren't in strike at the same time. But one of the most formative moments for me politically mm. was the moment that I saw that picture of Jair Ben Desai when I was a, I was a teenager. Mm. Uh, so it would have been about, about 10 years after the strike ended. And I saw a picture of Jair Ben Desai standing on the picket lines, very famous photo. She's got her fist in the air. Mm. She's wearing a sari. Mm. She's got her trade union armband. Mm. And it's so, so inspirational and such a powerful image Mm. um, that, like, for me, kind of, I was, you know, young Asian teenage girl Mm. kind of growing up and questioning Mm. all these various things about my place in society, my Mm. place in regards to my family, Mm. and seeing this figure like, like, like this was just incredibly inspirational, mm. powerful movement. And I think there's a way that you can talk about these kind of things without just completely objectifying and mm. orientalizing the fact that there was a striker wearing a starry. Mm-hmm. If you want to go and see a striker, you know, go anywhere. You, you could have mm. seen them at Imperial type, right? You could have seen them at mm-hmm. Mansfield. Mm-hmm. 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 If you go, in, yeah. go to <laughs> India and you want to see, you know, yeah, you know, up to you know, up to fifty, hundred million yeah, at a time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. the last general yeah, strike in, in India had, yeah. had how many, how many parties? Uh, over a hundred million. Hundred yeah, million, and exactly. Yeah. And- I was referring to a general strike in India in 2012, which had about 100 million participants. Since then, there was an even bigger one in November 2020, with over 250 million participants, many of them in saris. Another issue with the more recent coverage and cultural discussion around the strike, which is very common in the recounting of history, was the reduction of events about thousands of people down to a couple of individuals. Amrit here is referring to a play which came out in 2018 called We Are the Lions, Mr. Manager. The whole spirit of the thing gets lost Mm. because now also looking back at the strike, um, because we live in a kind of different, culturally a different era, you know, we're so much into individual success Mm. um, that there's this awful tendency to create um, celebrities, really, you Mm -hmm. know. Um, You don't know anything about celebrity, but they're just there because they're celebrities, you Mm. know. Mm. And that's what they have largely done Mm. to Jab and unfortunately. Mm. But also, like, it's, you know, you can say that it's easier that way, it's easier to express something. But it's also like, it's also deeply unpolitical, it mm. depoliticizes it. I mean, for example, there was a, the, the play that has been done um, about the convict strike. On certain, um, you know, in, in some ways it's, it's a good play because um, the acting is good. Um, it brings together some of the events of the strike. I mean, it's, it is uh, very well done for what it is, but it has some major flaws in that it focuses really on two people, mm. two main people, one is Jack Romney mm. and one is Jab and Desai. So the, the main, I thought the main role of theatre was to 
what's the challenge and make you think mm -hmm. about how your life is related to that. And that just wasn't there. It was mm -hmm. completely missing. You know, you just saw these two heroic figures mm -hmm. without any question of, yeah. as to where we are now. Yeah, I think it's often also a thing of how how history is is taught and how it's is that you know it's you know the yeah so Grunwick becomes uh, Joe Vindesai versus George Ward. So the minor stripe becomes Arthur, Arthur Scargill, Scargill versus Thatcher. Yeah. And what gets lost is that actually there are, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of people. Of it, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, who And, you know, people who will now forever be forgotten apart from for the people mm. who maybe were there. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's the same. It's like Jeb and Desai was named by uh, Radio 4 Women's Hour mm. as um, one of the seven women who've had most impact in the last 50 years. I can't remember what Mm. phraseology was but but you know to have her her named and yes on the one hand it means that you get to tell some of the story behind mm -hmm. the strike and why she became important but yeah it's it's like Amrit says you lose that mm. collectivity a strike by definition is a collective action mm -hmm. yeah right yeah. so you know to venerate one individual mm -hmm. is is always going to give you a slightly slightly false impression from both the successes and failures of the strike there are things we can learn today which was a central part of what the grunwick 40 group attempted to do with all of their commemorative events i think those lessons were brought out by grunwick 40 and the mm. event which you organized because now um low paid workers or migrant workers you know mm. precarious workers are organizing independently with mm. member-led unions mm -hmm. you know and they're winning yeah and i think this is a key thing this is what links runwick to what's happening now mm. and those points are never made mm. it's the the smaller unions you know mm. the united voices of the world the iwgb and mm -hmm. you know these unions who are member-led who are really, they're bit winning victories, mm. not at APAS, <laughs> through action. And if you, if you look at the way they're operating, they're incredibly dynamic, mm. incredibly responsive to what their members want and need. And they're, and they're winning. They're winning battles against outsourcing. They're winning battles for, for London living wage, you know. And these are, I think, some of the most inspiring actions mm. that we're seeing anywhere at the mm. moment in, you know, across any kind of sector mm. and i think that making the connection um between what happened at Bromwick and what's happening um amongst these groups of migrant workers is has was always again a really important part of the, the mm. Bromwick 40 commemoration project um to say that that it's migrant workers who are more often than not in the forefront of fighting for better mm. pay, better conditions. It's not because of migrant workers that you're, you're, you know, you, you haven't, you're being paid less. It's probably because of a migrant worker that you're earning mm. something close even to the London living wage. Mm. The IWGB, Sujata mentioned here, are the Industrial Workers of Great Britain, another small rank and file run union in Britain. Along with the UVW, they've won some inspiring victories in London in recent years by taking militant strike action. And when workers do come together to fight for our collective self-interest, it can be an unforgettable, beautiful thing. Best memory is my the support, the what we were getting is the best support I never get in my life. I when I saw most of the picket man mass picket, there was. Eyes, my eyes was full of water. Let me tell you, I I can't stop myself. That look, what a support we got. That's what I feel. I saw when I saw the support from the public, my heart is full of love. Let me tell you. That brings us to the end of our double podcast episode on the Grumwick strike. We hope you enjoyed it 
and got something from it, even if you'd already listened to our original episode about the dispute. You can learn more about struggles by Asian, black and other migrant workers in Britain at this time in the excellent book, The Making of the Black Working Class in Britain by Ron Ramdin. You can get it in our online store, link in the show notes. And as a listener to the podcast, you can get 10% off the cost of that or anything else in the store using the discount code WCH podcast. As always, we've got sources, links to more info, transcripts and more on the webpage for this episode, link in the show notes. Again, we're only able to make this podcast because of support from you, our listeners, on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us for as little as $2 a month or the equivalent in your local currency at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Supporters get great benefits like exclusive access to episodes, as well as bonus episodes, free and discounted books and merch, and more. If you can't spare the cash, don't worry about it, but please do tell your friends about the podcast, share links to episodes on your social media, and take a second to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. One more time, thanks to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Stone Lawson. Thanks also for Disky Del Sole for permission to use our theme tune, Bella Ciao. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Tyler Hill. Thanks to all of you for listening. Catch you next time. Mi dirà no che bel fiore, questo è il fiore del partigiano.